Amen. And um, how many know that when you give your life over to Jesus, amen, that death is not a period, it's just a comma. Come on, talk to me in here. Amen, somebody. Y'all might have heard me tell this story before. It was a, 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 a father and a son driving in a car, and a bee flew in the car, and um, the son is going crazy. And the father just reaches out and grabs the bee. And so the son calms down for a little bit while he's holding the bee in his hands. And he squeezes the bee, and the son is thinking, okay, he's going to destroy and obliterate this bee. And then the father does something uh, 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 not normal. He just lets go of the bee again. And the bee is flying all over the car, and the child is losing his mind again. And so the father... The child says, Dad, why would you do that? He's going to get me. And, and, and then he stops his son and he says, Son, if you look here, what I've done when I was squeezing him, the, the stinger in him, that's the only part of him that can hurt you. But I've squeezed that out of him. And no matter what, how loud this beast buzz and flies around here, he cannot hurt you anymore. Amen. Now, you know, when Jesus went to the grave, yeah. That was the father's feeling. How many of you know that's the God we serve? That's not, that's, uh, no, y'all, um, amen. That's no, nobody else God. That's no God like Jehovah. Amen. And uh, so we don't, we don't fear death, but we do mourn. We don't mourn as those that don't have any hope. Amen. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read, and I'm going to try my best to preach quick, and then we're going to get out of here, amen? So, uh, 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 God is good, amen? Hallelujah. Let's pray over the word of God. Father, I thank you for your word. It is already blessed, and I pray that you speak in this house, Father. I pray that you speak to every heart, Father. I thank you, Lord, for all that you have already done up until this point, and I pray that you be blessed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, there's a lot of talk, and we heard it a lot this morning, about purpose and destiny. There's a lot of books written on purpose and destiny and finding your destiny and six steps to your next destiny and how to, you know, be you. And there's a lot of people make money off that positive speaking stuff. Amen. People spend a big money and tune in to, to hear people speak because we are looking for some type of, because there's a concept floating around like, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's this specific purpose and destiny that you ought to fulfill. And so you hear people saying like, you know what, I, I'm trying to find myself. Mm -hmm. Y'all ever hear people say that? Yeah. Man, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to find who I am. It's funny to me because if you lost, how, like, how do you, how do you, how, if you don't know who you're supposed to be, like, how do you find it? Like, how do you know what it looks like? You know, if I don't know where I'm going, how do I know when I get there? Y'all follow what I'm saying? Now, there's nothing wrong with having a purpose and a destiny, but it just seems like everybody's concept of purpose and destiny equals money, fame, fortune, and everybody knowing your name. Amen. Nobody ever thinks purpose and destiny is in God's hands. Right. Yeah, we're well, gonna talk a little bit, amen. Right. And so, and so, 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 so. Oftentimes, I've heard people say, and I've heard preachers say it: go to the graveyard, and you'll find the most potential ever in the graveyard. And it sounded deep when I was a kid. I heard, and I said, "Man, I mean, it's true, man. I want, I don't want to die with all this potential. There is no potential in the graveyard. There's not. Everything in the graveyard is dead. When it's dead, nothing can be accomplished. Do you follow what I'm saying? The greatest potential is alive." Do you follow what I'm saying? Nothing in the, there's nobody coming out of the grave. You're like, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to win the NBA title. Let me back. There's no backing up. There's no going back. It used to sound deep when I was a kid, but it doesn't make any sense. I believe somebody gave a speech the other day saying that when they won the Academy Award. And I was there, I was crying. I was like, I feel you. It don't make sense, but I feel you. There's no potential in the graveyard. Everything that you can or want to do, has to be done while you're alive. That's right. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so with that in mind, everybody wants their life to count. And there's nothing wrong with wanting your life to count. Two men asked Jesus. They said, who's the greatest? Jesus never said there's something wrong with wanting to be great. He just said, rethink the concept of great. He said, great is, the greatest is to be a servant. Nobody likes that definition. 
You hear servants, you like, that's work. <laughs> that's serving someone else. Mm -hmm. Amen. People say things like, if you're always working 24 hours on somebody else's job, you're fulfilling someone else's dream. You should, and it's like you almost feel like we, we live in a culture that all, always tells you you ought to be your own boss in everything you do. So, so, so we live in a place like this. You can have a man over here feeding the homeless. Somebody come along and be like, hey, man, what's your purpose? You're like, I want to feed the homeless. I'm like, hey, hey. Yeah. And then they'll say something like, yeah, you know, I, I, just, I just got dreams of feeding the homeless. You know, I, I just, God has given me a vision. You're like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so what has happened is not really that we really want to help people. is that we want to be the boss. You get the credit for helping people. But how many know that, that, you know, when you work for in the kingdom, you don't really got to get credit. You don't really care who shine. If you see a need, you just meet the need. You just get to it. I like people like that, amen? That was different than Mother Teresa and, and many people in history. Mother Teresa just went there, saw a need, and said, I'm going to go. Sell everything I got, I'm going to go, and I'm just going to trust that God is going to help me to help people. One of the greatest individuals we've ever seen in history. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? Sometimes before people see the need, before people just go meet the need, they got to know, well, you know, so how's this going to go? Like, are you guys going to put it on Instagram? Before people go do a good deed, they got to do this. Hey, hey, hold this for me real quick. Hit, hit play, hit play, hit play. I'm helping him. My name is Rich and I'm out here. I'm helping homeless people, y'all. Look at them. He's homeless. Poor man like dog. I ain't took a shower in months. You gonna do this to me like this? You know what I'm saying? And then he come up and he, he starts singing. And he sings so good he get a record deal and you messed up. You, next, you call him later and talk about, bro, I was the one that was my camera that take that. Or 10% of that. This world is crazy. Our whole concept of purpose and destiny is thwarted by what we consider the American dream. Nobody want to help anybody more. Nobody just want to do stuff to help people anymore. And, and, but there's nothing wrong with wanting to be great. We just got to have God's definition of these things. And God, the maker, he's made you. You see, the thing is this, right? A fish was created to swim. And this is my whole thinking. And, and I'm, I'm going very fast because I got to go in the water. So I'm talking about fish. God help me. Uh, but... <laughs> The, the, whole, the whole concept of potential and all of that, it, 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 to me, is, it, it sounds good, but, you know, and, and we say things like, I can do all things through Christ, and we really don't understand what, what that means. Remember, it says, I can do all things, but then there's, 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 there's something else there, only through Christ. So, so which means, God, God has not called you to do everything. There's some things he called you to do that only through him it can be accomplished. Y'all uh, follow what I'm saying? So a lot of people, a lot of people, use, I can do all things through Christ. You want to go box with Mike Tyson? You're gonna get beat down. That's not, you know, you cannot do all things. He didn't call you to that. You follow what I'm saying? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And so, 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 a fish was created to swim. It's natural to him. It's it's what he does. Now you take the fish out of water. This is what we say. He has potential to swim. Right? He has the potential to swim, but it will never be accomplished unless he gets back in. You follow what I'm saying? We say trees. Trees have, you know, once they're planted and they grow and they, they bear fruit. What kind of fruits y'all like? Come on, shout it out. This is a Guyanese section. Everybody says mango over there. What y'all say over here? You said Aki? This is a Jamaican section. <laughs> Apples. Okay, Americans, we recognize your presence in your own country. We will not, please don't send us home. <laughs> New people are like, where am I? <laughs> And we're trying to figure out, and, and here's the thing, man. A lot of us abuse purpose. 
A lot of us are trying to do any and everything because we don't understand what we were created to do. Now, here's the thing. Just like a tree needs soil, just like the fish need water, man was created to live in the presence and the will of God. And when disconnected, he tries to figure out all sorts of things to do with his life. And he's on this quest for purpose and destiny and trying to find himself. You will never find yourself if you don't know what yourself supposed to look like. If you want to know what a human being is supposed to look like, Look into the perfect law of God that describes why men were created. And then when you can see why you were created, what you're supposed to look like, then you can begin to search to find yourself. Amen. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. And so the Bible gives us all of this beautiful stuff about, you know, why we were created and, and, and God has plan and a purpose. And here's the thing. A lot of us, a lot of us, we kind of just... We, 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 we set out to chase these things and, and, and live and chase these things. But God is not somebody that is far away. And he's like, figure out why I put you here. And if you get it wrong, I'll punish you. I believe God is concerned. I believe there's, I call it, this is my theology now. So this is, you know, I believe there's a sovereign will of God that nobody will ever change. I believe there's the revealed will of God. Things like you should not steal. You like you don't got to pray about that. Like, Lord, this dude's about to sell me this TV off the truck. Lord, is this your way of blessing me with a new TV? If you want to go to jail, yes. If you want a prison ministry. Hey. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There's certain things you don't need to pray about. Like, Lord, Lord, you know... Lord, you said that you will never let my enemies triumph over me. My neighbor, Lord, you want me to, Lord, that dog, nobody like that dog in this neighborhood. So should I do what's necessary for the peace? You don't got, you don't got to hurt the neighbor. You don't got to put poison. Hey, bless the Lord. Amen. You don't, certainly you don't got to pray about cussing. You don't got to pray about fornicating. Lord, you know I love her. Lord, you know my plan is to marry her. Well, until you do that, stay, amen. Yeah. I ain't scared of none of you. You understand what I'm saying? Certain things you gotta pray. But then there's the everyday living. Like, what does God want me to do? And we complicate that, man. I just believe, like God says, you know, like some people, some some, some people, some people live like, like like this. They're like, you know, I just want to abstain from the world so that God can use me. You're really trying to be a monk now because you might as well move to Tibet and isolate yourself. You know, I just don't want any influence. I just, I'm, I'm fasting Facebook and Instagram. And, and don't get me wrong, those, th those things are good. Sometimes you, if you're out of control, you need to, you know. But, 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 but this concept of I just need to be eliminated from the world in order to get God. You're trying to make God fill you. That's, that's new age ways of thinking. It's crept into the church. All the wisdom that God has given man, it was given by God. Television is a good thing. How it's used can make it bad. Social media is a good thing. How you use it is what makes it bad. Music is a good thing. How you use it makes it bad. So if we just eliminate ourselves from the world, darkness will penetrate all those areas and there will never be light. God says be in the world, but not of it. As, as a parent, I try to shelter my kids. You know, I try to, now, I'm like, Lord, even when I try to shelter, they get it elsewhere. So now it's like you, you just kind of got to let them know what life is and, and try to give them the gospel. It's the same thing with us. We live in this world and we try to shelter ourselves from certain things, but it's going to hit you anyway. But you got a greater force working in you than he that is in the world. Nothing in the world. Darkness could never chase light. When we walked into this room this morning, whoever put the light on, they didn't put the light on and darkness said, we will not leave. <laughs> darkness had to scatter from this room. Yeah. You can only know who you are when you know whose you are. Yeah. I want to take you to one of my favorite stories. My mother happened to mention it this morning, and it's funny that I was contemplating preaching that. And so it's found in the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to read this story. We're going to get out of here. I'm doing, uh, Brother Terry. You ain't king. You ain't king. They don't tell me what to preach. <laughs> Football season over anyway. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Saka in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephesus 
Damin between Saka and Avia. You try saying these words too that fast. <laughs> Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. And the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. See, I get the picture, right? Uh, old school war time. One set of people on this side, the other set of people on this side. They don't fight like that no more. Now they fight from home. They hit a button and stuff drop all over. Amen. Right? Uh, uh, and a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistines' camp. He was over nine feet tall. No matter how big you are. He could have played for the Knicks. There's a reason why I said that team in specific. All sorts of thoughts is up here now. This nine feet tall. Anybody nine feet tall? Close. Okay, Goliath. All right, give it up for Goliath. He's a church today. Goliath made it after. Look at God. God kept him when he lost his head. Careful how you shout out. He had a bronze helmet in his head, uh, on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. Wow. Some of you say, what's a shekel? I don't know. Sound like a lot. <laughs> Here comes this nine foot monster with this big armor. Woo! Woo! <laughs> and he comes out. And, and, and on his legs, he wore bronze greaves and on bronze, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. <sighs> we out here. Start the record. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. Some of y'all say, why? You don't even know what a shekel looks like. Wow. I recently went to the doctor. He told me I'm 22 shekels. Trying to get to the gym. I'm trying to get to 15 shekels. I dare y'all to do that. I dare y'all this week when y'all work out post. Wow, man. Found out this week I'm 16 shekels. Your friends will be bugging on something. carrying the shield. Like you all armor, oh, this is Robocop, y'all. You know what I mean? This is Terminator for real. This is clank, 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 clank. Come with me and live. Right? Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. Y'all send your best warrior. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Watch this. Then the Philistines said, this day. I like the reverb. That was nice. This day. <laughs> I'm in the valley of Elah right now. I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Y'all ever had a schoolyard fight? With that one bully? Y'all know what you Old school? Slap box? No? On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Why? Because of the size? That's what fear does. Fear looks big and strong and says, I'll destroy you. When things happen in your life, that's what happens. When you get fired, fear steps in and says, you won't have money, you're going to die, you're going to be this is going to happen to you. When people walk out of your life, you're going to be lonely. Nobody will ever like you. Look at you, you're terrible, you're a terrible person. That's what fear does. Fear tries to intimidate and say, I defy you and defy the God you serve. 
God has not given us. I ain't scared of nothing. Y'all hear me in here? There's no need to be scared of anything. If you believe in God, so they're scared. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. And Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war, and the firstborn was Eliab, the second was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Don't ever let nobody tell you because what you're doing now don't mean God don't. Oh, y'all hearing me? Here's the thing. When I preach that, here's the difference of what I'm saying and a lot of preachers ain't. Don't do small things because you tell yourself, if I do small things, God's going to give me bigger things. That's selfish. You're going to be doing small things forever. If you're going to be faithful to small things, love it. Love it to the point that if God never gives you nothing big, you're going to be faithful forever over that. Amen. Some of y'all don't like that. you like, no, I kind of want bigger things. Selfish motive. We, we, we try to manipulate God using his own words. God, you know I'm faithful over here because you are only because you said if I'm faithful over small things. You're not faithful. You're trying to hustle me. You only staying on that job, wait for me to promote you. Then you're going to tell everybody off. You're going to write an email. You're going to be the first one out. And then you're going to say, because God blessed you. So I got to keep you there until you learn your humility and learn why you were there in the first place and learn to serve and learn to love what you do and learn to help people for real and learn not to be, oh boy, y'all hearing me in this place. And so for 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and he took a stand. We got to go, we got to go, we got people to baptize. Now Jesse said to his son, take the ephah of roasted grain and 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry. So he, he just basically said, shepherd boy, come here, go give these brothers some food. Take them some food. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit, see how your brothers are, 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 are and bring back some assurance from them. Then they are with Saul and all the men of the Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Let's go, just keep, keep you flipping the tents up. Early in the morning, David left uh, the flock with a shepherd, loaded up and, and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Go on. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up near the lines, facing each other. So David is coming up. He got cheese on the cart. <laughs> he got bread. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hold us down. Ran to the battle. David don't. David want to join the army. <laughs> right now, he just watch his sheep. You know what I mean? But he really want to. He want to be in the mix. So, so all these stories of King Saul and all of that. We're going to see it go down the day. <laughs> and David left his things with the keeper. And, you know, he ran out to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. He said, what's up, fellas? And as he was talking with them, Goliath, hey, Israel, the Philistine's champion from Gap stepped out of his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David watched and heard this man. And when the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. David stopped there and he saw everybody running. And then he just watched this joker yell and scream. Now, the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage. And here's the best part. Will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. Now, them jokers ain't going, no, no, no. You going to pay, brother, you going to, if I do something great and my family get exempt, you going to pay me some taxes for that exemption. He said the whole family get exempt. Y'all feel this? David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Y'all see that? I like that type of talk. 
Everybody's scared. And David says, I'm going to look at the thing that is most trying to threaten my life and say, who are you that you got all of God's people thinking you bigger than our God? Let me tell you something. As a believer, you don't got to try to find purpose or create purpose. When you know the manufacturer who, y'all understand what I'm saying to me? When you, when in a car, if you don't, the, the, the manufacturer knows the design and why he made it. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, 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 a TV has a manufacturer. They know the design. They know why they made it. And if you want to know the purpose of something, somebody walks into a store and hands you a gadget, you don't know what it is, you're going to have to look at a manual to tell you what it is. Well, when you know God, there's not a whole lot of chasing you got to do for purpose. He begins to reveal to you, talk to you, walk with you. And then you begin to realize, I'm not even chasing purpose. I'm beginning to only chase God. So it don't matter where I am, in a valley, in a mountaintop, rich, poor, wherever he puts me, I'm satisfied. Because it ain't purpose that satisfies me. It's knowing God. Y'all hearing me in this place? A lot of Christians don't like that because they want, they want stuff to be satisfied. But how many of you know that the presence of God is the only thing you really need? Let me tell you something about the presence of God. It was represented in the Old Testament by the ark. And at one time, Eli's sons mishandled the way they're supposed to live in church. How many of you know you can have a position working for God, but it don't mean God's presence is with you? There's a lot of people leading pulpits and in churches, but God defied them from Christianity a long time ago. And these boys were wilding out, doing all sorts of things. And so they went into battle. They, they were losing. They said, let's bring the ark out. And God allowed all their enemies to whip them and take the ark. But how many of you know that when the enemy takes the ark, the glory of God is still. So the enemies were there and God said, I don't feel comfortable being around y'all. I belong with those people. And so, so the Bible literally said this. They took the ark and put it in a temple by a God named Dagon. Now, if I had the time, I'd explain who that is. But, but just picture it, right? They bring God's place that he said it will be a representation because God is not an idol. The real, the real example of that, if we were to break it down, is just all significantly pointing to Jesus Christ. Do you follow what I'm saying? And he's not an idol, but they, they begun to bring this representation of Jesus, the glory of God, and put it next to Dagon. Closed up the temple. Next day, the Bible said, they saw Dagon, the statue fell down and bowed down before the ark. That's the glory of God. Who is the uncircumcised Philistine to ever defy God? And that's what happens when you got the glory of God presence in your present in your life. And they said they put it back up. They said somebody must have knocked it down. Something must have happened. And God said, "Okay, so y'all, y'all trying to chalk this up to some natural stuff." Next day, they went back in there. His head was slapped off. Y'all are hearing me in here. They walked in, day and hold. It was like God in the middle of the. Y'all, I, I don't want to make God look like. That. But it's like in the middle of the night, God said, these jokers don't understand who I am. All of the gods will bow before me. Make no mistakes about it. I don't know about you, but I've searched his word and I've proven to myself who he is. This is not just an option. This is the only way for mankind. This is not just another religion. Matter of fact, he defies religion. He said you can do all the good works that religion tells you to do. Still you can't get to God because you're it is through me and only me. That is Jesus. Knocks him down. He started moving. Huh? I could, I could spend a, a whole other sermon right there. But God's glory, and let me tell you something. Anytime you connect with God's glory in your life, you don't got to chase purpose. It, it, it don't got to be what I got to you, You'll wake up, you'll do your daily routine, and God will bring things to you. God will speak to your heart. And that's the type of relationship I want with God. God, not where I'm chasing money. Not where I'm in this American dream where I feel like cars and houses and this and this career is what signifies you in my life. I want to live a life where I see somebody on the train and your spirit put it in my heart. Go sit next to that brother and tell him that his three sons is going to come home. And you just say, hey, I don't know who you are, but God, uh, y'all don't know nothing about this. Old school people would understand what I'm saying. When God wakes you up in the middle of the night and tell you go down to JFK, you're going to meet a man in a red shirt. Just take $20 and give it to him and tell him God has not forgotten you and you just go there on faith. You see that. You pop that $20 and tears break out and you walk in the way like, what was that? There is a God who is able to speak to you. I'm not telling you you're not supposed to 
too connected to God. See, the problem is too many Christians work a job, but they don't connect that with God. There's a reason why God has allowed you to be blessed. There's a reason why God has allowed you to work where you work. There's a reason. And even though you're accomplishing the things you dreamed of, it feels empty. Why? Because you have not connected it with God. for the man who kills him. Go on, go on. When Eliab, David's older brother, heard this speaking, he said to the men, he burnt with anger, and, and he asked them, why have you come down here? They looked at David, his brother looked at him and said, why you come here, you troublemaker? And with whom did you leave those few sheep? Look, look, look at the wording. If I had time, I'd, I'd tell you what's happening here. Why you come here? You trying to show off? That's number one. And number two, look at what they reminded him. Well, you left the sheep. That is literally saying, you're not a soldier, bro. You're a sheep herder. Know your place. You know your place. Y'all follow what I'm saying in here? But this is what you got to do when you meet haters. This is what he says. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down, oh, they, he's telling David this. You came down here only to watch the battle. Look at 29. David said, now what have I done? Said David, can I, can I even speak? <laughs> Pay attention to 30. That's what you do. That's what you do when haters bother you. He turned away to someone else. I don't got time to talk to you. You too negative. Not easy. <laughs> I'm trying to find somebody who's going to believe with me. Yeah. He turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered him as before. Look what happened. Look what happened. Go on. And uh, David said, uh, and what David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. See, when you brag, Come on now. the king going to say, okay, he bragging a little bit. Come into my office. And I ain't talking Saul. When you brag about Jesus, there's something about heaven that stops and says, somebody's been talking about me a little too much. You can't be talking about me so much and me not back you up. Who are we, who are we dealing with over here? And God shows up. Y'all ain't hearing me. The sister said it. In every season, things change, but God backs up his word. Hey, we said to Saul, let no man lose heart on account of this. Philistine, your servant, will go and fight him. So I replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he's been fighting, uh, he's been a fighting man from his youth. He said, I, I understand that. But you don't even know that while I was watching sheep, there was a bear that attacked. And you're looking at a little boy who killed a bear. And it was a time when the lion attacked. And you're looking at a boy who killed a lion. Y'all ain't hearing me. For time's sake, I gotta listen. Y'all read the rest of the story, but the story goes like this. Saul gave him the army. He said, I can't fight with your armor. I gotta fight how I know how to fight. Went down and grabbed himself some rocks. And uh, uh, here comes Goliath laughing, saying, Of all the people y'all got, you gonna send Rich? You gonna send David? And he's talking, and David is defying God. Uh, Goliath is defying God and saying things like, uh, 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 I'm going to cut you up and feed you to the dogs and defy Israel. Y'all about to get it today. I'm going to shut down the God. Ah, we know because they knew about them. You read it. They knew who Israel's God was. And they said, all of that stuff about him delivering you in Egypt is because Egypt, they had what we had. We the Philistines. You trace the Philistines' history, you'll know that they're one of the worst people that ever walked earth. And they were, they were hot. So sometimes you read the Bible says, wipe them out. And you're like, oh gosh, why are you want to? Because you don't know the people. Yeah, he was defined. This is where rubber meets the road. Why is he doing that? David over there. He's singing, man. Because y'all know he's a musician, right? He on some. They don't really understand. 
They don't get the picture. That's my son getting on that too. They don't, amen. He starts singing and worshiping God. Because he wasn't looking for purpose and trying to chase whatever the world told him. He just knew that God is who he says he is. And he knew that God had been with his forefathers. And the God who delivered them out of Egypt. And the God who was with Joseph. And the God who was with Abraham. The God who was with Jacob. is the God that is with me. It's the God. This is Y'all ain't even understand what I'm saying. And he's there just putting the stone in. And this man is over there saying, boy, I'm going to kill you. I'm, I'm going to crush you. And David is just winding up the sling. David is winding up the sling. And the Bible says this, that he said these words. You come to fight. This is what he told him. You came to fight with swords and spears. And you and think about this for a minute. Can you imagine all of Israel hearing this little boy? And all the Philistines watching this? He just shouted, you come to fight with your sword and spears! And everybody's looking, second guessing Saul. But I come to fight in the name I come to fight. Yes. I like that part, right? I didn't give up yet. Yes. These jokers might have, but I came to, I really came to bring cheese, but he switched the purpose. I came to fight. I was really only bringing bread, and I was serving, doing my due diligence bringing bread, but it seemed like they forgot who God is. So when they can't fight anymore, I come to fight. Here's the key, y'all. I don't have to search for purpose. I come to fight in the name of the Lord God. First bullet you've ever seen in history. It literally became one. It penetrated his skull straight into his brain and dropped that giant flat on the ground. Only the power of a gun could do that. David had the right to bear arms. But it's a different warfare. You got the right to bear arms. Let me tell you something. I'm closing with this. The worst thing is to be given papers and credentials that says this is what ought to happen, but the experience of what ought to happen don't match the papers and the license you've been given. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. Take a marriage, for example. Somebody gives you a paper and a certificate that says you are married. Now, what is a marriage? Well, a marriage is man and woman Loving each other, planning to get married, enjoying all the benefits of marriage, children, and it's supposedly supposed to be joyous. That's what the paper signifies is happening. But the life experience doesn't match what the paper says. Do you follow what I'm saying? You went to college all those years thinking that when you get that doctorate, that doctorate promise this type of life. But the life you're really living and the stuff you've gained from that doctorate don't match what the paper supposed to say. And it's the truth for many Christians. The Bible says this is the life you ought to be living. And you got the paperwork that shows it, but the experiences don't match what the word is saying. Why? Because in every scenario that I've painted, people, they detach the purpose for why these things happen in the first place. They forget why they got married. They start flirting with other people. You forgot that marriage meant you were supposed to be committed in order for this paper to deliver what it promised. But you stopped being committed, and now you're mad and saying that the marriage is... No, it's you. 
You got a doctorate and promise I was going to uphold these. When you got in there, money started going all over. You started signing stuff, doing all sorts of stuff. You started women came at you, your cars, houses. You, you weren't committed to the paper. And that's what we do as believers. We stray from the paper. And then when the experience of life is not matching the paper, we mad at God. If you do what the book says, you're going to be like David. When everybody else is cowering, I come to fight. You know, why? Because I got the paperwork to back me up. Now watch what happens. Somebody stand in this place and lift your hands to heaven.